Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first in a three-part series on Communities by Design on Civic Ecology. And it's presented in collaboration with the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan and Kent District Library. And we are uh, fun partners and wonderful partners, and we're glad to be here in this beautiful, beautiful library. And on behalf of uh, my colleagues, Erica Kubik and Rachel Brooks, the board of directors of the World Affairs Council, thank you for coming. Appreciate that. The Council's mission is to empower the people and organizations of West Michigan to engage thoughtfully with the world. We do that with the help of 40 regional businesses, 11 colleges and universities, and many community partners like KBL. And together, we seek to provide programming that is credible, objective, relevant, civil, and connected. To change the world, we believe, you first have to know and you can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. Tonight, again, we say a special thank you to our friends at KDL who have uh, annually partnered with us on this event and provide the beautiful spaces. And I'm going to ask Randy Goble of KDL to come up and tell you a little bit about what's happening at KDL. Randy? Thank you, Michael. Thank you. If you've not been to the Amy Van Ambel Library before, welcome. If you've been here before, welcome back. This is our newest library in our system. It'll be celebrating its second birthday very soon. We're really excited about it. And really happy to see you here tonight. We had a little switch in speakers at the last minute, but we're really excited to have tonight's speaker. He, uh, Dr. Norman has a book that's in the collection. You can find that by just simply searching in the catalog for his name, Dr. Eric Norman, or ask any staff. They can help you locate a copy of it. And speaking of books, Write Michigan is happening now. If you're not familiar with it, it's a little statewide short story competition that we started about 10 years ago, roughly. And uh, it's really quite amazing. If you're interested in writing or publishing or just curious about it, check it out. We have a lot of great workshops happening around the system and online. Plus, there's the, the short story competition. There's also teen poetry and photography. And it's all about finding ways to help people express themselves, their thoughts, their ideas. That's what we love to do. So you can learn more about that at writemichigan.org. And we're especially proud to partner with the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. For several years, we've co-hosted conversations like what's gonna happen tonight on issues that are important to us as individuals and also for the greater good of the community. Some of our previous topics have included water safety, civil discourse, just to name a couple of them. And KDL, our mission is, well, our purpose is that we exist to further all people. So equity and access are really at the core of what the library is about, as it is for every municipality and people who really care about their communities. So it's a really fantastic topic that I'm excited about personally. And with so much of development go around in the community, especially when you look at data. If you were here data 10 years ago, it didn't look anything like this. <laughs> What a transformation. But every community around Kent County, there's orange barrels popping up. I live in, in uh, Cascade where there's a strategic survey going on about long term visioning. Mm -hmm. So it's something that's on everybody's radar. And I'm especially happy that we can start this, this series with asking the question what is the role of civic design in creating more equitable, just, and sustainable communities that we're proud to call home? And with that, again, welcome. And Back to Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. <coughs> so let me introduce our speaker for this evening. I'm pleased to have Dr. Eric Norman with us uh, to begin the series on Communities by Design. And we're grateful that he's willing to share his expertise with us. Uh, he's a professor of natural resource management and an adjunct professor of economics at Grand Valley State University. He holds a MS degree in forest ecosystem management and PhD in Natural Resources and Economics from the SUNY College of Environmental Science and from Syracuse University. He's written on a variety of environmental topics such as urban stormwater management and land preservation and renewable energy. Dr. Norman served as a Fulbright Scholar and visiting professor at Kenyatta University in Nairobi, Kenya in 2012 to 13. And he is the author of The Uncommon Knowledge of Eleanor Ostrom, Essential Lessons for Collective Action. 
that just came out last year. And he's got great little uh, mm -hmm. cards that you can get to if you like them. I am amazed at her story, and Dr. Nordman will tell us a little bit about that. Uh, the first woman to receive the Nobel Prize in Economics, Eleanor Foster. After Dr. Norman's presentation, there'll be a lot of time for questions and conversation, and please uh, uh, pay attention to our house rules, which is to ask your question respectfully and succinctly. Uh, his presentation tonight is called Commons, Collaboration, and Civic Design. Let's welcome Dr. Eric Nordstrom. Thank you, every, thank you very much, everyone, at the uh, World Affairs Council of Western Michigan and uh, Kent Public Library, Kent District Library. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk tonight, uh, to kick off this series with a talk titled Commons, Collaboration, and Civic Design. Um, in economics, so I'm a professor, adjunct professor of economics, in addition to being in the natural resources program. And, you know, going back to Adam Smith, we've talked about in economics, how markets, um, you know, can market actors, people working in a free market, can lead to an efficient allocation of resources. Uh, as Adam Smith said, you know, as if being led by an invisible hand through individual actions that can lead to the public good. But sometimes, sometimes the, the invisible hand beckons towards destruction. And there are cases. Um, where each person um, you know, leading or acting in their own self-interest can lead to the destruction of a resource. And a famous example of this is an essay called The Tragedy of the Commons. You might have heard about it. It's an essay that was written by uh, an ecologist named Garrett Hardin back in 1968, published in Science Magazine. And it's the, the most downloaded um, and most cited article that science has ever published. So Hardin, in this, in this series, uh, this essay, The Tragedy of the Commons, talked about a pasture, a, past, a common pasture that's open to everyone in the community. And each person bringing their own animals to graze on this pasture, those people are following their own rational self-interest. right? And they get the meat and the, the wool or the, the leather, uh, all the benefits from their herd. But the, the cost of providing that common pasture is shared by everyone. So each individual person has their own interest. Uh, it's in their own interest to enlarge the size of their herd, bring more and more animals. But everybody following that rational self-interest eventually will lead to overgrazing the pasture. And that's what Hardin called the tragedy of the commons. That if we have this shared resource, it's destined to be overused. And he wasn't really, he used this parable of a pasture, but that's not really what the core of his argument was. He was saying any kind of shared resource, uh, this commons, uh, will be overused. And specifically, he was talking about what he called the population problem. And this was in 1968 when there was a lot of concern about overpopulation. And if you read the article, it actually goes into, it gets kind of grim and has some eugenics issues. It's not, it's not the, a great article from that perspective. Um, but it was very influential uh, throughout the, you know, for the last 50 years, throughout the 70s, 80s, and really today. It's one of the most uh, widely cited articles. But Hardin, oh, and he used this word tragedy in a specific way, uh, in the sense of a Greek tragedy. So if you're familiar with like old Greek stories, um, somebody might go to the, you know, an oracle uh, and have their fortune told at the beginning of the play. And the, the oracle tells the fortune, and that's what's going to happen, right? And there's no way out of it. So the interesting part of the drama is, well, how are these actors in the play trying to avoid their fate? And you know that at the end, you know, the king is going to be killed or whatever. Um, so, and that's really what Hardin was talking about when he used that word tragedy. It's in this sense of a Greek tragedy. That if we have this shared resource, that it's destined to be overused. And he, he said there were really two solutions to this. Either uh, use markets, privatize this common resource, this shared pasture or whatever, and divide it up into little sections. And if I overgraze my section, it doesn't 
you know, ha have any effect on your section, right? So privatize it and let the market figure it out. But then there's no commons anymore. Or have the state, the government, impose restrictions on us, uh, on the resource users. Because it was believed that the resource users themselves could not overcome these, this self-interest. Right? So you had to have the outside government impose restrictions on people. And this really did influence a lot of environmental regulations and a lot of environmental thinking over the last uh, half century. But maybe it's incomplete. So Eleanor Ostrom uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, and she was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economics for her work on collaborative governance of these shared resources, of the commons. And um, her most famous work is the book Governing the Commons, published in 1990. And it was really a culmination of decades of work that she had done traveling all over the world and meeting people and uh, visiting communities that had overcome this tragedy of the commons, that had successfully managed this shared resource and kept it as a commons, as a shared resource. Um, and she documented how they did this. So she really represented a third way between, you know, she said that, you know, markets can work well in privatization. Sometimes government regulations are necessary, but these aren't the only two options. There are beyond, what she said, beyond markets and states, there is a third way of collaboration and self-governance. Hardin's essay was, it was really an essay. It wasn't a hypothesis test. He didn't collect data. Um, and do any statistics. It was a persuasive essay. Ostrom, on the other hand, traveled around the world finding uh, instances of where these shared resources were successfully managed and places where they failed and actually were overexploited. Um, one of these um, places that was influential for her work was the irrigation communities around Valencia, Spain. Um, so outside of Valencia, there's a, a you know, compact city, but around it is what's called the Huerta of Valencia. Uh, and it literally translates to the garden. And it's a lot of small, uh, small farm plots, basically big gardens that depend on irrigation. So this is a very par uh, dry part of, um, of Spain, and the Rio Turia uh, flows through it. And the farmers have diverted that water to use for irrigation uh, in, the, in the farms around Valencia. It had been assumed for a long time in many contexts, uh, there was a phrase, it takes a great king to make um, you know, great infrastructure. But in the case of Valencia, it was actually the farmers that built this shared irrigation infrastructure and developed the institutions to govern um, the irrigation. It was actually, um, this system of canals, this network of canals, and the governance system was uh, created more than 1,000 years ago uh, during the Al-Andalus period of Spanish, um, of Muslim rule of what later became Spain. Um, and since then, despite changes in uh, rulers and, um, and civilizations, uh, this Tribunal de las Aguas, the water court of Valencia, has endured. So every Thursday, basically for the last thousand years, the water court uh, has met in front of the cathedral in central Valencia. And as the, as the, uh, the clock tower, the bell tower strikes noon, um, these members of the water court, who are farmers, landowning and active farmers themselves, who are elected to this court, they process out and they are there to hear any grievances. Um, so if, uh, if you left your the irrigation gate open and it flooded my field. I, we have a conflict. We can take it to the water court and uh, they will handle it. No lawyers are involved. It doesn't cost anything. Um, so you just present your case you know, the following week and they, uh, they hear it out and then they make a judgment uh, right there and then. So they have this justice function and then they have also an administrative function. They determine, uh, they work with engineers to determine how much water is in the reservoir how it's flowing, what season it is, what crops are needed, how much water needs to go where. 
Um, so all this has been going on uh, for more than 1,000 years. And it's not done through you know, top-down regulations. Uh, there's no water market. It's not privatized and traded. It is the community of farmers themselves who elect uh, leaders to their local canal districts, and then those leaders uh, serve on the, the Tribunal de las Aguas. Um, so this is one of the many, many case studies that uh, Ostrom found around the world in which people, by working together through collaboration and through self-governance, were able to overcome this tragedy of the commons and uh, sustain their shared resource. The flip side of a commons, a shared resource, you know, that's threatened with over, uh, over exploitation, is a public good. So this has a particular meaning in policy and economics. Um, a public good is something that's non-rival and non-exclusive. So it is, um, it doesn't get used up when you, um, when you consume it or when you enjoy it, and it's also hard to keep people from accessing. So it's a non-rival and non-exclusive. A good example of a pure public good in this case is uh, public radio or uh, public television. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. How many of you have listened to, let's say public radio, like WGVU, um, you know, in the last month? So raise your hand. Oh, wow, almost everybody. So keep your hands up if you are a member of WGVU. All right, so thank you for being members, lots of members, but a few of you put your hands down, right? And you're very, way overrepresented here in this room, I'm sure, <laughs> right? Lots of people listen to public radio, and, um, but relatively few listeners actually contribute. Right? And they need money to keep the radio station going, to keep the programs, to keep the programs on. Um, so some, um, Pew, the Pew Research Organization said that you know, compared to weekly listeners, um, you know, it's a small fraction that are actually members. And this is a good example of a pure public good. It's non-rival, meaning if I'm listening to the radio show, everybody else can, can still listen to it. We can all enjoy it. It doesn't get used up like a fish or a gallon of water does. Um, but it's also non-exclusive. If you don't become a member, they don't shut off your access. You can all still listen, right? It's not like a streaming video service where if you don't pay Netflix, they cut off your subscription, right? This is, it's a public resource, a pure public good. Um, so this is kind of the flip side of a commons. And with a, the problem with a pure public good is getting people to provide it. The free market, um, there's really no profit opportunity with a pure public good. If you can't keep people out who don't pay, well, then you're just going to keep losing money. And from a rational choice perspective, um, you know, the, the people that are listening but not members, it, it's entirely rational. You're acting in your own self-interest. Um, but also, it suggests things like Wikipedia should not exist. Wikipedia is this collaborative um, you know, encyclopedia that has grown you know, over decades. And it is entirely managed by community. Uh, people who are enthusiastic about the water court in Valencia can you know, write an article, a Wikipedia article about it, or update it when a new uh, person is elected. Um, they don't get paid for it. They really don't get famous on it. But people just do it out of their own uh, enthusiasm for the topic. Um, among Wikipedia people, uh, there are people who are known to be, um, have some prestige in the community. They are known to be uh, active and knowledgeable about particular topics. Even um, when uh, Queen Elizabeth passed away uh, you know, several weeks ago, there was a, a race to be who was going to be the, the Wikipedia editor that got to update you know, the entry for that. So there, is, there are incentives um, to participate in this, but, but not in the way that we typically think about it in the context of markets. Um, so this, where with commons, uh, you know, this challenge is, well, how do we stop from over-exploiting it? With pure public goods, it's how do we get people to contribute this? And Ostrom's work uh, touches on both of these. So when it comes to 
you know, civic design and collaboration, we can even you know, intentionally create situations in which we have a commons. Through the act of commoning, we can create these collective action situations and provide uh, you know, shared resources for everyone. In the context of climate change, um, which is a topic that Ostrom uh, dove into at, in the later years of her life, she passed away in 2012, um, she said, if we simply wait until the big guys to make a decision, we are in deep trouble. There was a lot of emphasis on climate policy at the global level to find one you know, single top-down solution that's going to apply everywhere, like a global carbon tax or a you know, universal cap-and-trade market, um, especially from the economic community, we really emphasized that. And of course, getting everybody to agree to a one-size-fits-all policy uh, was not going well, and she didn't think that we would ever be able to get uh, you know, to such an agreement. That doesn't mean we have to wait, right? We have the capacity to self-govern, that we can take actions uh, locally, you know, at the state level and at the national level, and all work together you know, through this act of commoning, and like that science says, raise ambition together. And her work really influenced the structure of what became the Paris Agreement on climate change. It doesn't have a, a it doesn't have any carbon tax or any legally binding obligations even. It's a voluntary approach in which each nation um, comes up with a climate pledge, a pledge to reduce their uh, carbon emissions, and then that pledge is compared to peer countries. And if one country's pledge comes in a little bit lower than you know, their peers, you know, they apply some pressure. And together, you know, the idea is that we're going to raise the ambition together. We may not have, you know, be on target with this round, but when we meet again in three years, let's regroup, let's ratchet up those targets, and over time, raise that ambition. So this Paris Agreement was really um, uh, influenced by the work of Ostrom. Uh, she did not live long enough to see it implemented, but it's also really illustrative of this approach of looking at commons not as a problem to be solved, but using them as a resource, like con actively constructing this as a commons where we have shared responsibilities and um, you know, shared opportunities. But it's not easy to get to. Trust and reciprocity are key ingredients um, for what she called co-production. Right? We're not going to we're not just going to wait for the market to solve it or wait for government to come to our rescue. Sometimes that's necessary, but um, you know, through community collaboration, um, if we build trust with one another and have re reciprocal relationships, that's really the key for this all to work. And I'm going to put up a long quote here, so bear with me, but it's important. Um, she said, what we have learned, this is from her um, Nobel Prize speech, what we have learned from extensive research is that when individuals are well informed about the problem they face and about who else is involved, we can build settings where trust and reciprocity can emerge, grow, and be sustained over time. Costly and positive actions are frequently taken without waiting for an external authority to impose rules, monitor compliance, and assess penalties. Right? We can do this ourselves. We can create these situations in which people can voluntary, voluntarily contribute and solve problems together. So I'd like to um, touch on a couple of examples uh, locally. We've, since this is the World Affairs Council, it seems appropriate to have examples from all over. We heard uh, from Valencia, Spain. We'll bring it back to Grand Rapids now. Um, one of Ostrom's uh, graduate students at Indiana University, uh, Asim Prakash, and his colleague, Matt Petoskey, came up with something called the uh, club, theory of, uh, club Theory of Voluntary Environmental Programs. And this encourages firms to go beyond compliance. Regulations are always um, you know, one step behind what's happening in the world. We're always trying to play catch up. And regulations really set the, the minimum standard. Right? Is, if you have an air quality standard, that's the just the 
minimum level of air quality that you are legally required to have. Um, and that's really not good enough. We need people and firms to go beyond compliance. Um, so, and there are programs around, and they looked at these different programs to see how successful they were. And they looked at these in terms of their enforcement and their standards. Now, if you have a voluntary program to uh, reduce air pollution, for example, you can have uh, like program A has really weak enforcement and very strict, uh, very weak standards. So if you, you know, the bar isn't very high, you're just going to reduce your air, air pollution by just a little bit. And if you don't meet that threshold, really nothing's going to happen to you, right? You're still in the program. Nothing's, there's no penalty. And yeah, you'll get lots of participation, but are you really moving the needle in terms of improving air quality? Probably not. On the other extreme, you could have a, you know, a voluntary approach to reduce air pollution that has very high standards and is, you know, they are enforcing it. Like there's going to be an inspector and you're going to get dinged very publicly, maybe publicly shamed if you don't achieve these targets. Now that's, that sounds great, but how many firms are really going to voluntarily, um, you know, be a member of this club, you know, this, this, um, this approach? Very few, right? So it's not really going to make a big difference. So the sweet spot is kind of in the middle, where you have you know, standards that might be aspirational a little bit, but aren't too hard. They're within reach of most firms. And there is some enforcement, because uh, as Eleanor Ostrom said, nobody wants to be a sucker. Nobody is going to repeatedly take steps to reduce their emissions if nobody else is doing that. right? No one's going to cut back on their harvest of uh, fish from this pond if nobody else is going to do that. They might do it once, but they're not going to be a sucker. They're not going to keep doing it over time. So there has to be some accountability and enforcement. Oh, sorry about the formatting there. Um, so how do, we, how do they structure this? Well, one approach um, is to provide benefits for joining the club. Right? You can, if you provide these benefits, that provides an incentive for these firms to join the club and reduce their emissions. And uh, what we want them to do is you know, reduce their emissions, generate positive externalities in the uh, economic lingo. Um, but you can also provide uh, exclusive opportunities, access to clients, um, exclusive information, you know, opportunities that are only available to those members of the club. And uh, so they, they call this the club theory of voluntary programs. Um, and oh yeah, and branding and reputation uh, can be part of this too, that if you, you join the club, you get to put, like, you're an energy star partner or something like that on your product. Um, lots of products today have um, you know, sustainably sourced paper uh, and things like that um, from the FSC, the Forest Sustainability Council. So you get these branding and reputational benefits by joining the club. So there is some transaction here, um, but it's voluntary. And you have to have some standards. Um, they need to be strict, but not too strict. And there needs to be some enforcement of these. One of these that's um, local here is the 2030 district here in Grand Rapids. It's part of a network in the United States and Canada of um, I forget what it's up to now. It's more than 20 uh, cities that have adopted uh, a 2030 goal. So the goal is to reduce uh, building energy use, building water use, and transportation-related uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 50% uh, by 2030. And Grand Rapids is one of these cities, along with uh, Ann Arbor and Detroit and uh, several others in, across the Great Lakes and the Southwest. Oh, and in Toronto as well. So they establish these shared goals of you know, reducing and building energy use, water use, and transportation energy. And they encourage progress. This is all voluntary. Um, you know, they, they meet together to share progress, to encourage one another, uh, share knowledge. That's really key. If you go to the meetings, you can learn about what other people are implementing. You know, they put in a heat pump. They put in insulation. How is that working out for your building? Um, 
there are modest penalties. If you aren't on target or you, and you aren't meeting regularly, you can be demoted from a 2030 district city to an emerging district. Um, so, you know, there's, it's not a big penalty. There's no financial harm in that, but it's, you know, it doesn't look good. Nobody wants to be, you know, the city that gets demoted to an emerging district, right? And uh, it's, these are organized in what Ostrom called a polycentric network. For complex collective action situations, Ostrom said, um, Ostrom found that these, or, that the uh, communities can be organized in a, uh, in a network, this polycentric network, like federalism in our federal government. So we have a federal government, then we have state governments, then we have uh, county and local governments. They're all doing related things. Uh, there might be some duplication, um, but in general, for complex situations, you want to have these, these networked situations. So you have fewer people, you know, you're com you know your community, right? And uh, instead of having one size fits all approaches that would be appropriate in, you know, nothing's going to be appropriate in San Diego and Tucson, as well as Grand Rapids and Toronto, right? The, the climates are totally different. Their energy needs are totally different. Uh, you have small, um, college towns like Ithaca, New York, and Ann Arbor, and you have you know, big cities like, uh, like Dallas, Texas. So instead of a one size fits all, there, it's organized into this network where each city can uh, figure out what methods are appropriate for it, but then they can share information at, within building participants at the city level, but then also meet uh, for annual events uh, and share across it at that, uh, that network level. Uh, so this is working pretty well here in Grand Rapids. We have one of the most active 2030 districts in the, uh, in the network. Um, Los Angeles was one that was quite active, but then kind of fell off and got demoted. Uh, so there is some real world accountability. It does happen from time to time. Um, I'm gonna skip this one just in the interest of time. Um, so in its own way, commoning is this form of self-governance. Um, oh, going back to the 2030 districts, it, it's really critical here in Michigan because the policy in Michigan is that cities cannot make their own building codes. Uh, so you can't have a building code at the city level that's more strict or more ambitious than the state. The state sets the building code. Um, so in order to encourage, there are lots of actually organizations that are encouraging uh, firms to go beyond compliance, to make buildings that go, you know, that go beyond just this, the minimum in terms of energy efficiency and insulation and things like that. And so the 2030 district is really critical for a place like Michigan to, to encourage building owners and operators to go beyond this minimal compliance. Um, so commoning is a form of self-governance. And uh, I'm part of a running club in Grand Haven. And, um, you know, th so this approach really reminds me of uh, the running club and a quote that I saw in, a, in an airport, actually, um, in South Africa. It said, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. If we want to make, you know, big strides in um, energy efficiency, um, we need to go together. We need to work together, uh, collaborate, um, you know, top-down solutions might be great, but we can't, we can't afford to wait for them to come. Uh, there's a lot of work that we can do ourselves uh, through self-governance and through working together. And to, uh, to sum it up, I'll leave you with some words from Eleanor Ostrom. She really emphasized that the market and the state are not the only options, that collaboration is possible. And she said, humans have a more complex motivational structure and more capability to solve social dilemmas than they are given credit for. A core goal of public policy should be to facilitate the development of institutions that bring out the best in humans. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much, and we have plenty of time for questions.
Mm -hmm. Even if he didn't know what that meant, he had heard of it, and she said, no, that's just not correct. So what, what made her uh, able to really see things in a different perspective? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question. She was a graduate student at UCLA in the uh, 19, early 1960s, late 50s. It was actually an undergrad there as well. Um, so maybe I'll just start at the beginning. So she was an undergrad at UCLA and um, had um, excelled in economics, um, was an uh, undergraduate uh, test grader, teaching assistant, and then um, graduated, uh, married her husband. They moved to uh, Boston. She worked and put him through uh, law school. She wanted to go back for a PhD, but he did not approve. And this was in the late 50s. He thought she should be a corporate wife. Um, they divorced. She moved back to LA uh, and then applied for uh, the graduate program in economics. And they would not let a woman in the program. They thought that it would just water down uh, and ruin the reputation of UCLA. So she uh, moved over to political science, which had not let a woman into the PhD program in 40 years. And the school said, you have to. You must let women into the program. So they, uh, she was part of a cohort of four women uh, that was in the political science program. So she ended up studying her interest in political science and um, what she called public entrepreneurs. So people who work in the public sector that creatively solve problems like um, you know, entrepreneurs do in the private sector, starting businesses and things. And she looked into her own backyard for her research topic, and those were the water managers of the uh, West Basin of Los Angeles. So underneath the Los Angeles metro area, there are groundwater resources that are really important. So there's the Colorado River Aqueduct, there's the Los Angeles River, and then they have, on the surface, then they have this groundwater resource. But the groundwater resource is you know, divided on the surface by these arbitrary municipal boundaries. So each municipality was drawing from this shared aquifer and just pumping away because they had an interest in um, you know, economic development and that groundwater was really essential to industrial development and drinking water and agriculture. So nobody alone had an incentive to cut back on that, especially if others were not going to cut back. So throughout the 1920s, uh, they were pumping more and more, and the salt water started to intrude into the aquifer. Uh, the level of the aquifer was going down. They were suffering from saltwater intrusion, and they were risking actually physically harming the aquifer because it can be compressed, and you lose that pore space. Um, and then when you, if it gets salty, then it's uh, no good for any of those resources. Um, so through the 1930s and 40s, they started to come together, these water managers um, started to talk with one another and realized that they had a shared problem. And the state of California was also saying, hey, you have a problem and we're going to impose restrictions on you if you don't get your act together. So there was that kind of threat hanging over, but they did voluntarily come together and start negotiating and formed this uh, West Basin Water District, West Basin Water Association. And you know, through trust and reciprocity, they were able to reduce their water use and start to uh, enforce, uh, kind of voluntarily enforce, but also through courts and things, uh, you know, water reductions and water efficiency. So that was her uh, PhD thesis, it was written in 1963, before Hardin came out with this phrase, the tragedy of the commons. So she wasn't really looking at it from a natural resources perspective, she was looking at it through this political science institutional perspective. Um, she went on to study other forms of municipal governance, uh, especially in policing. Uh, she did a range of police studies, including a study of Grand Rapids, um, looking at large metropolitan police departments. In the 60s and 70s, consolidation was all the rage, uh, efficiency, and uh, she found that small police departments were more responsive to the community than these large police departments. Um, so she was studying you know, institutions and this polycentric network of institutions. 
It wasn't until the 80s that she returned to kind of natural resources um, through several of her colleagues and then found that that was a really fruitful uh, opportunity. There are all these case studies, not only in political science, but in economics, in anthropology, in sociology, in forestry, in fisheries, that all these people in academic departments and government agencies were studying pieces of the problem, but nobody was crossing disciplinary boundaries. So that's when she started to put all these case studies together. Um, and then in her book, again, she came up with these eight design principles um, for successfully governing the commons. So I know it's a lot to read, but things like setting boundaries, both physical and social boundaries about who has access to the resource and who doesn't, um, having locally tailored rules, um, people, you know, individuals who are most affected by the rules can participate in the rulemaking, so it's very democratic, um, monitoring, conflict management, and you know, complex systems being organized into layers of nested governance. That's that um, idea of polycentricity. And you know, this is what she's most famous for. I didn't want to overload you with the technical stuff, but um, you seem to be interested in it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, these are, these are uh, what she wrote about in that book, Governing the Commons, and what she's most famous for. Yeah, hi. Uh, so, the talk is a lot about how we want to structure self-governing of the commons, um, mm -hmm. which I think is great. As someone who has no background in public policy, it's a very mysterious to me how that gets started. Do you have any insight into that, like how the 2030, um, I forget what it was yeah, called. Yeah, the 2030 so district. Like, like what are the actual steps have taken to, you know, to get that adopted and get people on board? Yeah, that particular one is a, um, it's a program through the, the AIA, it's the American Institute of Architecture, I think, uh, the AIA. And so that's a, an industry group that is promoting this. So they have a whole bunch of programs on sustainable building. So, you know, it's, yeah, they are a, a business organization, but they're, you know, working through policy, well, not really policy, but it's pretty complicated. So I, I, phrasing it like there's the market, there's the state, there's collaboration, there's actually a lot of overlap. So yes, it does take um, a champion to start these things, to start an organization like that. Um, Ed Masria is the person at AIA who started this 2030 network and the Architecture 2030 Challenge and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so having one person lead the charge who is you know, charismatic and has the network to build it, that's really one of the critical elements. Thank you. Well. Um, so as you talk about the people leading the charge, um, I'm involved with some cooperative housing mm -hmm. projects in Grand Rapids and talk about obstacles. Zoning, mm -hmm. neighborhood associations, yeah. uh, all kinds of things like that. Um, how have some of these other people been able to work past that or break stereotypes or especially in the local area? Because that's where my migraines lay right now. So that's a that's a big challenge and Bring your class over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they need a crop thesis project. Yeah, we'll send it to the zoning board for our yeah. staff. Yeah. I mean, in, in the case of California, um, with the was the water management district, uh, the the state of California's laws are very amenable to creating these uh, these institutions, like the the West Basin Water District. There were other. Basins also cre created water districts after that, but also the, the basins created districts for the Colorado River water and for groundwater recharge, building like the physical structures, like who's gonna pay for, like, to put water back in after you know, when they're pumping it out. So they have a whole bunch of districts that are layered on top of each other with some are the same people, some are slightly different boundaries. Um, so, one of Ostrom's ideas, along with her husband Vincent, is that things can be very messy 
But sometimes messy is good in that you have some redundancy in the system. Um, so like those police departments where uh, you know they say, well, you know, this city has lots of small police departments. Why don't we just have one big metro? Sometimes that works for things like the crime lab. Like not every small community needs like a big expensive crime lab. That maybe that works for a centralized location that serves the whole region. Um, but in terms of uh, you know responsibility and accountability to the people, you know, the smaller police departments worked much better than a large metropolitan police department that was kind of impersonal and they didn't have the local knowledge. Um, so I don't like there's in, in Europe they're like oh well, yeah you know the, the cooperative housing is very common there. yeah um, like you get here and it's like oh it's a country country folks over here um, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just like yeah we've had some nightmare zoning situations and neighborhood associations and things like that mm -hmm. so yeah if you have any eager students here I'll hook you up all right okay <laughs> <laughs> let's talk you had a question. Uh, yeah, so you said uh, the key is trust. Um, how do you build that trust? How do you put trust in um, When Ostrom was studying those groundwater managers in Los Angeles, uh, at first there was a lot of distrust. Nobody was talking to each other. Um, there were Nobody had any idea how much water anybody was using, any groundwater. And it really took, um, like, the the lead engineer from each of these communities to just like have a cup of coffee and like start a very personal relationship with the other individual, you know, the other engineer in the other community. And so it really was a personal thing that started. And now, okay, we can talk about this. We are both engineers. We share the same problems. And then they can go back to their department and say, all right, that community is somebody we can do business with. You know, I trust that person. And, you know, through repeated interactions, you can develop that center of trust. Ostrom was, did a lot of work across a lot of different fields and collaborated with all kinds of folks. One of the, she collaborated with somebody who was really interested in game theory. So she, they had, you know, they ran all these games, uh, the different structure games of like, yeah, how do you build trust and how can that trust be eroded in these different situations? So, you know, variations on the prisoner's dilemma, if you've ever studied game theory. Like the tragedy of the commons is basically the prisoner's dilemma. And if you face this choice, you know, do I rat out my, my co-conspirator or do I stay silent? You know, I'm not gonna explain it all to you now, but you know, the choice of do I, you know, cut back on my harvest or am I gonna just get as much as I can? Uh, so a lot of the work that she did with game theory was around these issues of trust and reciprocity. Other questions? Maybe related to that, um, when you think about trust building, you're really yeah. talking about uh, communities at a local level. Right. That, uh, when we think about individuals having trust in the government, the state, yeah. the market, um, is that also a way in which uh, we can start to develop strategies for solving? Yeah, I think, you know, the rule number three, individuals who are most affected by the rules can participate in rule making. That if, if people feel like they have a stake that they're being listened to, they're more likely to trust the, uh, you know, their leaders or, you know, politicians, the elected officials. Um, I think there's typically, I think, more trust in local governments. Um, where the people are more accountable and they know, they might even know the person personally, like a, like a friend or a neighbor who served, you know, the mayor of your town, you know, on the city council or something. Um, I think as you go further away from the people in, in terms of that bureaucracy and hierarchy, the trust tends to erode um, because, yeah, you you're, have feel that you're not being listened to, that those, if folks are not necessarily accountable 
uh, to what's happening on the ground. So keeping it local. Um, some problems are, some problems can be solved locally, but some problems have to be scaled up. Um, they can't be just solved, like those water managers couldn't solve the problem individually. They needed to collaborate at a, a higher level. So um, it's really important to figure out what is the scale of the problem and then design an institution that fixes the problem at the right scale. So some things could be too high up and some solutions could be too down in the weeds. You gotta find that sweet spot. Yeah. Hasn't um, the, um, uh, one of the uh, benefits or effects of this is um, they got creative by bringing these um, uh, uh, stockholders or mm -hmm. shareholders uh, involved. Um, they got creative, and uh, and uh, and the whole dynamics of that water is changing very dramatic. And, there's, and they're going to make more changes yet. You know, or get more creative, I should say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, the. The West, Western water law is incredibly complicated. Um, there's a whole system of prior appropriation where there are markets <coughs> for water and they can be traded. Um, so yeah, there are, there are lots of, for, there are profit making opportunities um, based on water rights. And it's throughout the whole Colorado water basin is facing a tremendous amount of pressure right now. Um, so you see that at the, the states in the basin, like there's the Colorado and Utah, the upper basin states, they have allocations and U Arizona and California are big users downstream and they every state has their own interests, but then you have corporate owners of water rights and farmers and cities all at the local level uh, vying for that precious water. So yeah, it's, Tremendous challenge. Eric, do you know yeah. uh, other other examples from West Michigan that you might know about that meet your criteria? I mean, you talked about Grand Rapids participating in that one. I, I think about the, the Plaster Creek mm -hmm. initiative, which again goes to all a number of different municipalities. Right. You got farmers, you got corporate, you mm -hmm. got uh, residential, and Everybody's got to, in order to actually clean that thing, everybody's got to do their part, but they're not governed by the same people. There's no, in some cases, no, no fining anybody for mm -hmm. doing what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, it, I don't even know if that's an example. I don't know if that fits your example. Of I think it does. It's a real, it's a watershed partnership yeah. where you have, you have companies, landowners, nonprofits, colleges, everybody's kind of pitching in in different ways to manage that resource and hold one another accountable, raise the ambition together. I think that's a good example. Um, another one in Ottawa County is another groundwater issue where in central Ottawa County, uh, kind of Allendale, Zeeland, Hudsonville, there is, uh, it's hydrologically disconnected from Lake Michigan. And there's been a lot of residential development in that area and they're actually drawing down the aquifer to the point where some new houses uh, had no water. They built a house and then they went to sink a well and there's just no water there. Um, so those, it, it's an aquifer that spans multiple townships and Ottawa County is, doesn't have any authority to regulate that, but they're kind of convening uh, the, a township consortium uh, to get people on municipal water where it's possible uh, to work with farmers uh, for more efficient irrigation and uh, try to uh, save that water aquifer. So that's happening right here in Ottawa, where I live in Ottawa County. Any more questions? I'll throw one more in. Sure. All right. Um, so Ostrom uh, seems to be approaching this from a public policy and economics point of view. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know of any? one you'd recommended reading from like a sociology or anthropology point of view? I mean, it's a lot of community organizing, which yeah. I think would... Um, in anthropology, uh, I did talk to a professor who was the first anthropologist hired 
by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Mm. He specializes in studying fishery communities. He's an anthropologist that studies uh, fishery communities. And he wrote a book called The Lobster Gangs of Maine. Okay. Um, and so I have a chapter in the, in the book that I wrote about it. And we interviewed him for it. And these, uh, yeah, he studied how lobster harvesters, they're regulated by the state of Maine. Um, you have to have a license. But also, they have customary territory. So if you're in a harbor, you probably have fished that harbor your whole life. You're usually a father, grandfather has been in that community. And you have these customary places where this is where I put my traps, and that's where you put your traps. And they, you should not cross territory. Um, so they have, they take it upon themselves in some sometimes illegal manners to enforce that territory. Um, you might get snubbed at the grocery store or at the bar or something like that. Um, but also, sometimes a neighboring harbor will encroach on the territory of a whole harbor. And then they have to work together to defend their territory against encroachment at a harbor level. So these lobster gangs, what he called lobster gangs, uh, kind of they compete with one another and they work together and enforce these territories. And it's all very interesting. But Jim Atchison was the name of the guy, uh, the anthropologist, who was, uh, he's very well known to that. Thank you. Let's thank Eric for <laughs> that big thing. Uh, book on Eleanor Ostrom, you can check it out. During yes, the you're in the library. KDL branches, they have the book, yep. and uh, you can talk to Eric about how you can get it. Uh, we'll be back a week from today, and uh, Sister Damien is going to come. Sister Damien Marie Savino from Aquinas College, and she's going to, uh, you know, Eric took a little bit of the work of Eleanor Ostrom. She's going to take the work of an encyclical, encyclical mm -hmm. by Pope Francis, which talked about creation care and a collaborative effort in get, coming together, mm -hmm. and uh, there are principles there that we can learn from and uh, have a basis for understanding. And then in two weeks, uh, Ken Yoakum is coming from the University of Washington. And he's going to talk about communities in, uh, dealing with their waterfronts. Of course, that affects us here uh, by Lake Michigan, right here in Grand Rapids. And uh, Ken's going to take examples from Seattle, his hometown, but cities around the world and how they uh, figured out how to have an urban area that's thriving, but yet protect their waterfronts and their environments around it. So, Two great topics to, to follow up on a great topic tonight. So thank you for coming. We'll see you next week. <laughs>